Turn with me, please, to that chapter from which I read, Genesis 49. I want to draw your attention tonight to verse 29 and maybe a few other uh, surrounding verses. That's the main focus. It says, and he charged them, Genesis 49, 29, and he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Let us just bow together for a word of prayer before we come to consider God's Word. Heavenly Father, we wait before Thee and we draw nigh again into Thy presence in the name of Thy Son, our Savior. We thank Thee for the way of access that we have to Thy throne and into the courts above. We come through Christ Jesus. We come upon redemption ground. We bow down at this moment. We confess our need of Thee, that need of the power of the Spirit of God, that help that He gives, that He exercises when the Word is preached. And so, Lord, cleanse my heart from all sin and breathe on me and fill me with Thy Spirit. And may the Word come with freshness, with authority, with clarity to every individual, both in this building and those who join with us online. Lord, let a work be done, a lasting work be done for Christ's sake. And so hear our prayers and abide with us as we continue before Thee. We ask this all in Jesus' name for His sake and for His glory. Amen and amen. After Jacob had left Canaan at the time of the great famine in the land of Egypt, he made his way down into Egypt, and he was there for 17 years. Little is known about those years. He lived until he was 147 years of age, and by that time, of course, his life had come to a close. All of those 17 years are largely passed over in silence, and it's not until we come to this stage in Genesis 49 that we are shown something of the very last of Jacob's long life as he speaks in these verses that we have read this evening. This whole chapter is devoted to the story of Jacob's death. Not only is he a very aged man, but he is now frail and ill. Sickness has come upon him, strength is receding, and therefore nothing remained for Jacob really but for him to die. His public usefulness and his service for God as a man of God for that day was all about to come to an end. And yet, though his public ministry is over, he had a private ministry to discharge and to conduct before he finally uh, passed away, before he finally breathed his last and left this world. That ministry was to gather his sons, all twelve of them, around his bed, from which he spoke to them individually as the Lord had directed him. When he had completed his revelation of truth to those twelve sons, when he had given them his final words, then he spoke to them collectively in this verse and in the verses that surround it as he actually referred to his death, and he gave final arrangements to his sons to be carried out with regard to his burial. And in that way, we can see the calmness with which David, or sorry, Jacob faced his death. It comes across very plainly. His attitude toward his death is in stark contrast, of course, with the way in which he had lived in his earlier years. Those early years were lived without the Lord. Up until Jacob was a man of many decades in terms of the length of his life, he had passed those times, those years, in a life that was filled with sin and with its consequences. Jacob was a conniver. He was a twister. He was an unscrupulous man in so many ways. With great cunning, he 
obtained the family birthright. He deceived his aged father, his blind father, for the purpose of obtaining the blessing that was to fall upon Esau. And therefore, his old father was vexed, his brother was enraged, so much that Jacob had to flee for his life and go on a journey that took him far from his own home. Years later, he faces death and God's eternity. And yet we find that he does so as a very intimate with great consolation and great assurance. The Apostle Paul comments on this in Hebrews 11 and verse number 21, where he writes these words, By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. That incident of blessing Joseph's sons is in chapter 49 of Genesis. And yet it's part of Jacob's deathbed scene. And so he comes to the end of life's journey. He is a man of faith now. He's blessing his progeny, his grandsons. He's here speaking to his own twelve sons, including Joseph. And all the while he's worshiping God. He's resting in God's promise. And therefore, what peace marked his final moments. What a way to die and go out of this world. What a message there is in Jacob's death for all of us as we read these verses, and especially for those in this gathering or maybe online tonight who are yet lost and on ready and unprepared to meet the Lord. It's impossible for you to face the end of life's journey as Jacob did because you are yet in your sins, and you're under the condemnation of God for that sin, and you face eternal ruin, and you face everlasting hell. And so, facing death with peace and assurance, that is the message of Jacob's passing out of this world. And so, that's what I want you to think about tonight and focus on as we come around the Word of God, as we consider a number of facts from this verse and from its context with regard to Jacob's death. This man who's old, who's frail, who's dying, and yet notice what he has to say. There are three things here from these words in verse 29, and as I say, the context, the setting of that verse, I want you to think with me about tonight. Number one, Jacob's destination. He says in our text, verse 29, I am to be gathered unto my people. I am to be gathered unto my people. That is a striking way of describing one's death and the destination that awaits a man like Jacob. I am to be gathered unto my people. Very different even in the context of the descriptions of others in the Word of God, what they used when they came to die, when they were leaving this world. Jacob here does not say, I am to die. He says, I am to be gathered unto my people. Now, think carefully about that. That expression, being gathered unto one's people, is a term that is found in the Old Testament Scriptures several times, here in Genesis as well as in a few other places. It's used of Abraham and Isaac. It's later used of the departure of Aaron and Moses and some others as well. The word translated gathered means to gather together or to gather up. And the sense is, as Jacob uses it here, I am to be gathered unto my people. The sense, therefore, is I am to be gathered up unto my people. And so it's a very striking way of describing or analyzing your death, used with regard to death, the, the word signifies that the person in question is being gathered up unto those who have passed on before, who are going or who are in the same destination to which Jacob is now going. Notice here that those with whom you have an association in life are going to be your companions in eternity. 
When Jacob says, my people, I am to be gathered up unto my people, he refers to God's people. Yes, among them there were some very close family members. He's thinking of his grandparents, Abraham and Sarah. He's thinking of his parents, Isaac and Rebekah. He's thinking of his wife, Leah, who's actually mentioned here in these verses. But he also refers to ones previous to those I've just mentioned. He's thinking of the saints of God going right back to Abel. Abel, you know, was the first man to die in this world, as most of you will be aware. Isn't it fascinating that the first person whom death took away from this world was a child of God? Indeed, the first person ever to die was a martyr for the faith, because Abel was slaughtered for the simple reason that he loved God, and he knew the gospel, and his life and his testimony were a condemnation of his brother Cain. And Cain lifted his hand, and he slew his brother, because Abel's life was a testimony against Cain's wickedness and Cain's rejection of the gospel. But the first person to die in this world was a child of God. That is very significant, very important, because God was laying down a marker that while death had come upon the human race, there was deliverance from the penalty of sin that brings death, and eventually uh, there is deliverance for all those who rest in Jesus Christ. And so, God's people were this man Jacob's companions and associates for the, the major part of the last section of his life. And to them, he is now going as he leaves this world. There's a little phrase in Hebrews 12, 23, and it's this, the spirits of just men made perfect. And in the context there in Hebrews 12, Paul is writing of things that are in heaven. There are actually seven of them. I'm not going to get time to take you there tonight and look at those few verses in Hebrews chapter 12, but there are seven things there, seven parties there. God, of course, and the angels, and Christ, and so forth. But they're all in heaven. And included in that description of what's in heaven, Paul and Paul mentions the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, at that stage, he's writing about the Old Testament saints. And therefore, we're taught from Hebrews 12 that when people died in Old Testament days, they were in heaven when they died. And they were made perfect at their deaths. That's the sense of the language. Perfect with regard to their sanctification. I mentioned this this morning. In justification, we are immediately pardoned for all our sins, accepted by God, and we are declared righteous at that, at that precise moment. And we will never be any more justified than we are then. Justification is not a process. Justification is an instantaneous act on the part of God. But sanctification, as I was saying this morning, is progressive. And therefore, when Christians come to die, they are made perfect in the sense of the final sanctifying of their souls, for it's the soul that goes to be with the Lord at that stage. They are sanctified in that sense, fully and perfectly, and yet they're with the Lord immediately. The spirits of just men made perfect, and that's written of the Old Testament saints and now, as we look at this chapter, Jacob's about to become one of them. He's about to go to the spirits of just men made perfect. Those have mentioned multitudes more because Jacob's ready to die. And this is how he describes his death. This is his destination. I'm to be gathered up to my people. What a testimony he left behind. Now, that expression to be gathered up and so on, is used as well of some unsaved people. I think of Ishmael. 
I read of Ishmael's death in Genesis 25 and verse 17. It says this, Ishmael gave up the ghost and died and was gathered on to his people. Who were Ishmael's people? Ishmael was not a saved man. He was a man of the world. He was a lost man. The Bible makes that very clear. Other worldly men were his companions in life and then became his companions in eternity. We're told in Genesis 25 again, verse 18 this time, that Ishmael died in the presence of his brethren. All around him there were those who were his associates, his companions, and he died among them. He died in their presence. They couldn't stop him from dying. They couldn't hold him back. Ishmael dies, and Ishmael's gathered to his people. My friend, learn this, learn this well. Those with whom you associate in life are the people whom you're going to join in eternity. How are you living? Young man, young woman tonight, who are your companions? Who are your friends? With whom do you traverse the path of life? Whom do you love in terms of company? Where do you like to go? What are your pursuits? What are your habits? What are you doing with your life? Where are you attending places and, and events? that are ungodly, that are wicked perhaps, and you're running with the world. And if you keep going that way, and that's how you associate with people in life, that ungodly company, do you not understand that those who are your associates in life will be your associates in God's eternity? Here's a man of God, and he's coming to die, and he's going to be with the people of God because he had come to know God's people and love God's people and enjoy their company and their presence, and he'd have thought of his old grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac, and he'd have said to himself, I'm about, I'm about to see them again. I'm about to go to be with them. Do you sit here tonight and you can think of a grandfather or a father or a mother or a brother or a sister or whoever it might be, some godly individual. Let me ask you, Will your destination be to go to be with them and their company in the glory, the glory of heaven, the glory to see the glory of God, the glory of Christ? You see, you can only be associated with God's people in life, or sorry, in death, when in life you personally seek their God and their Savior. That had happened in Jacob's life. Have you ever asked to set yourself the question, you Christians, when was Jacob saved? When did the change come? He wasn't a very savory character when you study his early life. But you know what he could say, and he says this in Genesis 48, when he was talking to Joseph and his two sons, he said this, the angel redeemed me from all evil. And we looked at that expression, the angel, a little this morning. It's another reference to the angel of the Lord. It's a reference to Christ. And he can say there in Genesis 48 and verse 16, the angel or the messenger of the covenant redeemed me from all evil. Let me tell you, friend, there is only one Redeemer of sinners. There only ever has been and only ever will be one Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And while Jacob lived long before the historical event of the Savior's birth and the Savior's life and the Savior's death, nonetheless, he knew about the Savior. He knew about the angel of the covenant. He knew he would come. He knew he would die for his sin. And he knew that he would, he would make redemption for him. And therefore he can say the angel, God's Son, the messenger of the covenant, redeemed me from all evil. And Jacob's words, therefore, in chapter 48 show that he had come to know this blessed person, and he had been 
redeemed by him, and that Christ would appear someday and actually die for him and shed his blood for him. And Jacob was trusting in all of that grand and glorious promise. You see, though he had godly parents and a godly upbringing, he himself needed to be redeemed personally. Otherwise, he could not have gone to be with the saints at the time of his death. May I say to you tonight that salvation is not a proxy affair. No one else can repent for you or believe for you personally. You must turn from your sin, and you must seek the Savior. The wonderful thing about this whole story, this whole account of Jacob and his destination, I am to be gathered unto my people, caught up to be with my people, all because he's a redeemed man. The wonderful thing about it is this. It was not so much that Jacob sought the Lord as it was that the Lord sought Jacob. There's a remarkable little statement in the book of Hosea that makes that clear. Hosea 12, verse 4, let me tell you what it says. He, that is the Lord, found him, that is Jacob, in Bethel. He found him in Bethel. That means the Lord found Jacob. That means that the Lord went after Jacob. At a certain time in his life, when Jacob was not right with God, in fact, when Jacob was running away from God, at that moment there at Bethel, the Lord found him. He had fled from his father's house because of the trouble into which his sin had brought him. And he got to Bethel. And at Bethel, Jacob was given a revelation of Jesus Christ. And it was there at Bethel that he was redeemed. And I'm talking here about that wonderful event that you read about in Genesis 28. We often refer to Jacob's ladder, and that's fine because it mentions this ladder in Genesis 28. What was that all about? Jacob had a… it wasn't a dream, let me tell you, that you and I might have. You might go home tonight, and you might eat something that would cause you to dream. And it's a, usually a whole rigmarole, a model. I see some of you smiling. You know what I mean. Jacob didn't dream in that sense. God gave Jacob a vision of something wonderful. He saw this ladder at Bethel, and he got a, a, an understanding of the meaning of that ladder. In Genesis 28 and verse number 12, it says this, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And what is that all about? He saw this ladder. It was set up on the earth. The top reached to heaven, and there were angels ascending and descending on that ladder. What is all this? Ah, my dear friend, in that ladder we see a presentation of the great truth of the only mediator that there is between God and men. That ladder was set up on earth. That's very important, because in that little detail, you're being taught that the one who bridges the gulf between God and men, the one who is the ladder that connects earth with heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ, is that ladder, is that mediator, because He was set up on this earth to be that mediator. Christ was born. Christ became man. Christ descended from heaven. He came into the world. He took our humanity. He lived in our stead and in our place. And so there's His humanity. The ladder symbolizes it, set up on the earth, but then it says its top reach to heaven. And in that little detail, the top reaching to heaven, you have Christ's deity. And so, simultaneously in the one ladder, you've got this symbolism 
of Christ and his humanity and Christ and his deity, the latter on earth and yet the top reaching to heaven. There's the person of Christ. Do you see it? Do you hear it? You need a Redeemer who has deity and humanity combined in his one person, and that is who Jesus Christ is. Do you see what I'm saying? You need to be reconciled to God. You're a human being. You are a man or a woman. You're male or female. But you're a member of society. You're a member of the human race. Without Christ, you're lost. In your sin, you're lost. You're condemned. You need someone to mediate for you. A mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Only one. And that mediator must be like you. He must have humanity. But he must also have deity. Because he must bring God and men together. And therefore he must have the nature of both. And what a marvel, what a, a wonder is the person of Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? There are people who will tell you, churches and religions, who will tell folk about this one and that one and refer to those individuals, those personalities as mediators. And of course, the chief culprit in our little country is the Church of Rome. Rome makes Mary a mediatrix, a co-redemptress with Jesus Christ. But the Bible says there's only one mediator, and it's not Mary, and it's not Joseph, and it's not the angels, and it's not whoever you care to mention. It's the Son of God, because in our Savior's blessed person, you've got His humanity and His deity united. And in that way alone is He qualified to save us. That rules out everybody else. Rules them all out. And so in that ladder, Jacob saw Christ in his person. The foot of the ladder on earth, the top of the ladder touching heaven, a wonderful portrayal of the person of our Savior. We also saw the work of Jesus Christ. You see, the ladder, think about the ladder. The ladder does remind us of what Christ does in his work. That ladder in Genesis 28, it brought earth and heaven together. It linked the two. And that's what the work of Christ is really all about. Christ's work is God's way through His Son of bringing sinners on earth into union with Himself and eventually bringing them to dwell with God in glory forever. I'm not going to get into the, the, the issue tonight of the angels ascending and descending on that ladder. That's fascinating. I'll just simply refer to one verse. Hebrews 1, 14. And you know, this verse sums up what the ministry of angels actually is. Hebrews 1, 14 says that they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. And so, if you study angels in the Bible, the whole subject, you will find that angels are inseparably connected with God and with Christ, and taking Christ and His work. What do you find? There were angels present when He was born. There were angels present when He was in the wilderness being attacked by the devil. There were angels present when he was buried and when he rose again and when he ascended up and there'll be angels present with him when he comes the second time. In the Bible, the ministry of angels is inseparably connected with the work of Christ because the work of Christ is for our sakes. And that's what the angels ascending and descending on that ladder are all about. Do you know that when, uh, when Jacob came to die, angels carried his soul up to glory? We learn that from Luke 16. Lazarus died, 
and the angels carried him to heaven. It's a wonderful story. The ministry of angels to the redeemed of God, to those saved by grace. Oh, what a way to die! You might wonder, Christian, uh, you might say to yourself, oh, when I come to die, how will my soul get from here to glory? And the answer is, the angels of God will come, and they'll carry that soul up to glory, and they'll do it in an instant, because they're supernatural beings. And as the old hymn says, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. The angels were carrying Jacob home. He saw all these things. He saw this vision of this ladder. I have to move on here. But here is how we know that Jacob was a redeemed man. God found him at Bethel. God revealed the ladder to him. God showed him the way of salvation. And therefore, against that whole background and that whole glorious revelation that he was given, Jacob can say, the angel that is the messenger of the covenant redeemed me. And that's why his destination is to go to be with his people. I ask you tonight, my friend, is Christ your Redeemer? Are you trusting in His person and in His work? If not, for you to think of being in heaven is only a figment of your own imagination, because unless Christ is yours, unless you are on Christ, the ladder as it were, you can never reach the glory. That destination cannot be yours. Jacob's directive then, quickly, he says in verse 29, after saying, I am to be gathered unto my people or up to my people, he says, Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. And here he gives a directive concerning his burial. Literally, it was that he would be taken back to the land of Canaan and he'd be buried in the family plot in that land. Verse 30 refers to it here, a cave in the field of Machpelah that Abraham had bought. You know, the only thing that Abraham ever owned when he was on this earth was a grave. Isn't that interesting? He never owned another square inch. He was a, a nomad. He walked, he traveled, he was a sojourner, he was always on the move. He owned nothing but a burial ground. But there's great meaning in all that. And now Jacob wants to be taken back to that burial ground. I told you, 17 years before this event, he had come down into Egypt. He's now 147. So 17 years before, at 130, he left Canaan to go down into Egypt. But you know what Jacob had done before he left Canaan? When exactly he did it, I don't know. But I learned this from Genesis 50 and verse number 5. And here's what Jacob, here's what Joseph actually, or what's referred to there concerning Jacob in the whole context of Joseph taking his father for his burial. It says this, Jacob told Joseph to bury him in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. In other words, before those 17 years of living in Egypt, Jacob had already dug his grave. He had it ready, and it was waiting for him. He went down into Egypt. Then he died, as this chapter shows. And then he's carried back up into Canaan, a journey of of, a, of hundreds of miles, and he gets there and he's buried there. Why was he so intent on being buried in Canaan? Why? Would Egypt not do? Why go to all that border, uh, bother? Well, on what was he focused? And being taken back to Canaan to be buried, he was focused on the rest, I mean, the consolation that would follow his death. You see, he's talking about his body. 
And he says, bury me in that cave. As soon as Jacob expired here in Genesis 49, the very end of the chapter shows this, he yielded up the ghost. That's the old English word for spirit or soul. So he yielded up his soul, and his soul departed to be with God when he was still in Egypt. But he says, bury me in Canaan. And the point that I'm making is this directive was a pointer to the rest, that is, the consolation, the peace that his soul would already have begun to enjoy because his soul went to be with the Lord at this moment. You see, my dear friend, some Christians have had terrible deaths. Let me make this point clear this way. Some Christians have had terrible deaths. Some Christians have been torn to pieces by lions. Some believers have had their bodily parts scattered here and there. Only God knows where their atoms lie. But that does not affect the peace that they enter immediately, the rest that they enter immediately upon their deaths. As soon as the parting comes, irrespective of where the body might lie or what might happen to a Christian's body, that person's soul is immediately with the Lord. As it says in Revelation 14, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, from henceforth saith the Spirit, yea, that they may rest from their labors. So Jacob knows that he's going to his rest. He knows that he's going to be with God. God Himself said concerning Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, I am, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Then he goes on to add these words, God is not the God of the dead, but the living. And that was spoken by Christ thousands of years after Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob had died. But they were very much alive. Oh, only God knows where their dust is. But my friend, their souls were with the Lord for a few thousand years when Christ said those words. And they've been with the Lord since that moment that the Lord did speak those words. Their bodies dead, decomposed, turned to dust, their atoms scattered, but their souls are resting with Christ. And that's why Jacob wants to be buried in Canaan, because the restful repose of his body up in Canaan is a portrayal of the peace and the consolation into which he has entered at his death. What an awful contrast with those who die in their sins. God says there is no rest for the wicked. You die in your sins, my friend, you will not be safe and secure in glory. You will have no peace. Your soul will have gone into torments, suffering punishment. And then when the Lord comes, the body will be raised again, reunited with the soul of the unsaved person. And that unsaved person, body, and soul will be tormented day and night forever. No rest, no peace, either now in the intermediate state for the soul or when the Lord comes and body and soul are brought back, reunited, nothing but torment and pain forever. What an awful end. Jacob also wanted to be buried in Canaan, not only because it's a symbol of the rest that he would have when he would die, but because it was a symbol of the resurrection that one day he knew would take place. 
lying in Canaan, buried there near Hebron. That's where, Jacob, or that's where Abraham's burial ground was, near Hebron. And you know that one day the trumpet will sound, and wherever Abraham's and Sarah's and Isaac's and Rebekah's and Jacob's and Leah's bodies are, in the sense that only God knows, they will rise again. Those bodies will spring from the ground where they lie. Oh, yes, long ago, having lost their form, having turned to dust, but they will live again. And Jacob's thinking about that. Bury me up in the land of promise, because God has promised a resurrection to His people. Don't bury me in Egypt. It's a time of the world. Take me up to Canaan. It points me to the glory. That's His directive, along with His destination. As I close tonight, look at Jacob's departure, the actual departure. Verse 33, when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost, the soul, and was gathered unto his people. There is his actual departure. His ministry is now over. It says there, when he had made an end of commanding his sons, that 33rd verse, an end of commanding his sons. He has nothing more to say. He has nothing more to do. His work is finished. His ministry is over, and now he yields up the ghost. And he did so in this remarkable way. He gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost. Remember what I quoted from Hebrews, where Paul comments on Jacob's death? And in Hebrews it says that he worshipped when he was dying, he was worshipping, leaning on his staff. So Jacob, in the final moments, he's standing, he's worshipping God, and when his work is done, he lies down, he gathers up his feet into the bed, the way you might see an elderly man or woman when they go to bed, or even maybe yourself. What's the last thing you do? Well, you gather your feet in, and you lie down. It's a wonderful picture of a man's departure. Victory and calmness, and this felicity of soul that he feels. Jacob's telling himself, I'm going home now. I'm departing. My life is over. I can't live anymore. I'm now leaving this world. Center those details from the closing period of Jacob's life, the closing moments of Jacob's life, are penetrating and they are probing in their intensity. What a calm, peaceful scene. Will you die that way? if you're conscious at all? Or will you die in terror? Will you die in fear? Will you die with this awful apprehension, I'm about to go out into hell? You may have heard of Voltaire, the French infidel, who terribly blasphemed God in his lifetime, cursed God, etc. When Voltaire came to die, you know what his last words were? There is a God, there is a hell, and I'm lost. And he went screaming, out into eternity. 
I've been at the bedside of Christians dying. Some of them unconscious, some, some of them, I suppose most of them, am nothing because they're not in a fit state. But I have been in the presence of some believers who died and were fully aware of where they were going. And one of them was my mother and how she died in a glorious fashion. Relatively young woman whom cancer took away 28 years ago. And I can't forget the sight of her face, peace, joy, a smile, going home, departing to be with Christ far better. I am to be gathered unto my people, Jacob's destination. Directive, bury me in Canaan. Departure. He simply lay down as if he was going to sleep. But he was going to live, to be more alive than ever before. He was going to be with the Lord. Sinner, think carefully of your need. And tonight, Come to Christ. We're going to bow together in prayer. We'll not have a closing hymn. I trust that's okay. Let's just bow together. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Before I pray, could I say from this pulpit that should there be anyone here who's troubled, who's concerned, who's anxious about these matters of a lake, help and counsel. I'd be glad to give you time and open up the Word of God with you and, and point you to the Lord Jesus. And so, when you come down to the door, please make that known. And may God, by His Spirit, write His Word upon every heart, and may He bless it to every soul. And even those online, if you want help for your soul, contact this church. Someone will get in touch with you. Be glad to help you. Heavenly Father, use Thy Word. Bear it home with great power to precious souls. And may there be those tonight who will pass from death unto life and be brought to know the angel of the covenant, the redeemer of sinners, and be ready for God's great eternity. Hear and answer prayer. Part is with thy blessing. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit be the abiding portion of every child of God tonight and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.